And we continue with the next session of our Aim Across the Lifespan series. Uh, we have been talking about transition, and we're continuing that with Bridge to Post-Secondary Education. And so the recordings are going to be housed in the Accessible Educational Materials Group on the Oregon Open Learning Hub, and we are putting a bevy of resources and recordings uh, as support for AIM. Uh, Chandra has posted that link as well, and the handouts for this and all sessions for today are available in a short shared Google Drive, and so Chandra will also share that. Uh, but we welcome Felicia and Rebecca, and uh, we invite you to share more about yourself and about the passion and the topic that you're here to share with us. So please take it over. Do you want to go first, Rebecca? And then I'll sure. Try. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Rebecca Arce. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I am an equity, inclusion, and accessibility specialist for the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. So I get the pleasure of not only meeting with students, but I also get to work with institutions, faculty, staff that support all of our students. Um, so Felicia and I, yes, we are related. We have the same last name, distantly related. We have the Arsenos. <laughs> yep, and the chain. And, and we work in the same industry, industry or a field um, in the state of Oregon, which is also a really interesting connection. And um, when we keep reconnecting at certain events, it's just like, okay, we have to do something together. And I know that she brings a wealth of knowledge and passion to this, and this is what she gets to do every day. So I asked her to join us. Go ahead, Felicia. Yeah, my name is Felicia Arce. She, her pronouns. I'm the coordinate, uh, disabilities coordinator for the Disability Resource Center at Clackamas Community College. Um, some background, I went to Oregon State and I needed my materials converted. And this was back in like 2008. And so like there wasn't the apps and all that stuff. So I got my textbooks converted everything but in between I was doing that conversion myself so I learned a lot about optical character recognition and shields and all that stuff so um you know it was a real passion for me and then I got the job at the University of Wyoming um university or university for center for excellence and developmental disability doing aim and so I would teach people about aim all over the state you know it just I breathed it for four years so when Re Rebecca was like hey you want to do something with aim and I was like yeah I love that I lived that um you know I feel like uh accessible materials is really uh the catalyst for a lot of students and people um but yeah so that's kind of my story um Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I would tell people all the time, like, you know, everybody should have access to reading, you know, it's like being having access to water. So, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do the slides and, uh, Rebecca, do you want to have people ask questions as they have the question or do we want to do after for questions? Yeah. If they want to pop it in the chat <laughs> while we're going, that works too. We have a normal conversation. I'm sorry. Pat. Okay. All right, do you, let's see if we can get this, oh, not this one. Can you guys see it? Yes. Perfect, all right. Go. Bridge to post-secondary education. And I didn't know that this was gonna be saved forever and ever, so I would have polished this up a little bit more, but you know, this is, this is what it is. So, all right, so an overview is the introduction uh, we already did that. What is this, What is the Disability Resource Center? What is an accommodation? High school versus college. A little bit of assistive technology and then referring students to the DRC, how to contact us. And so today I work at Clackamas Community College. Um, I can't speak to any other college but my own. Um, I would say the first step is to go on their website and then give them a call. Um, on reaching other community colleges or colleges on how the DRC is processed. 
Okay, so what is the Disability Resource Center at CCC? So the DRC is a resource that provides support to students with disabilities, faculty and staff, both on campus and online. And we say that because it's really a dual partnership. You know, we serve students, but we also want faculty member faculty members to know why we are doing this. Um, why, why do we need extra time? Why does a student need to be able to take a break during uh, their exam? And our primary goal is to work with our faculty to provide that equitable access to higher education for our students. And we do this for with accommodations, advocacy before with the student and the faculty, um, because also the faculty need the student to understand like, hey, here's the protocol for this class. This is the learning outcome that you need be, you need to demonstrate. We also do campus trainings on assistive technology. So the way it works is a student has a diagnosis and wants to seek accommodations with the DRC. They'll send the DRC, uh, send the documentation to the meet uh, and meet with the DRC to demonstrate appropriate or to determine appropriate accommodations. Uh, students will request their accommodations every term. Uh, and then that's a, kind of a little bit of the difference between high school and college is it's up to the students to request their accommodations. We cannot request accommodations for them because we serve over 200 students. We have over 700 requests every term. So if a student would drop a class, we wouldn't be able to see that. So that's why it kind of needs to be on, the, it's on their plate to request their accommodations. They could always talk to us. They could come into our office. They could send us an email saying, hey, I need help with this and we will help them. But um, that's the the part of advocacy that the student needs to learn. Instructors will receive the accommodation letter and clarify with either the student or the DRC if they have any questions and the students will receive access not an advantage in their classes. So thank you for that. When we touch on these, um, there are two important factors. So one, um, Felicia talked about um, learning outcomes, right? So uh, can you talk a little bit more about that advocacy piece where you're not doing modified classes. Yeah. Doing so modified material. Yeah. So we, a classic example is a modification is everybody in the classroom has to do 20 math problems, but you do 10. An accommodation is you still do the 10, uh, 20 math problems, but you get time and a half to do it. Um, and, you know, there's going to be several examples of a what's, uh, a learning outcome. So for example, you're not going to get time and a half on demonstrating CPR. You know, that's their, their time is being measured with CPR. So uh, that's why our accommodation may not be able to be applied because they are measuring time. And then I just want to note too, that as Ali as Felicia said, this is specifically for Clackamas. What I'm trying to do in my role too is understand what are the different um, methods and requirements for accessing accommodations at all of Oregon's 24 public institutions, because they are all very, very different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just take a grain of salt as you're, you're looking at this. If you want to go to Clackamas, this is the, the exact steps. If you want to go somewhere else, you're going to have to start with that phone call. Yeah. yeah and so for Clackamas, you know, we serve we serve uh, Canby, uh, we serve Oregon City, uh, Milwaukee, uh, Lake Oswego, Westland. So we're what uh, Wilsonville. So it's a, a different demographic and these processes have worked for our demographic. So PCC has a different, different demographic and different uh, skill sets. And so this is how we um, have found some success in uh, this process, we're always working towards like a more smoother process. Um, so yeah, it is different at other schools. So what is an accommodation? It refers to the act uh, refers to the actual teaching supports and services that the student may require to, to successfully demonstrate learning. Only accommodations are shared with instructors, not their diagnosis. Uh, students are can feel free to share their diagnosis with their instructor, but it's not required. Um, I let instructors know like, hey, the student might need breaks in class because they need to administer their insulin or they might need break in class because they uh, just need to kind of 
reset their mind. So um, it's really just the same accommodation, but there might be different impacts for the student. So what we can't do, we can't modify learning outcomes. If a mon if the student needs to modify the learning outcome, they can do an audit where you're not really doing the class for a grade. And some students, they audit the class the first time and then they take it for credit the second time. So that's a, a way that you can kind of, you know, get your feelers out there, get grounded and then take the class for credit. Um, we can't do retake the test until they pass. You know, that's part of the learning outcome. Um, we, can, uh, we can't provide personal care assistance. Uh, and then also flexibility and due dates, unless the student's diagnosis impacts their ability to attend class. Um, and that will be different factors. So for example, see, see if they're seeking medical treatment, that's a way like they just don't have that time. So, so uh, students on dialysis, they don't have that extra, they don't have that time. So we're trying to make up for that time. So how do we support students? We do an intake meeting to determine appropriate accommodations. And in that meeting, we ask students, how does this, uh, how does your diagnosis affect your ability to learn and take a test? Um, and then we also let students know that like diagnosis and symptoms can change. So if there is a change, let us know, and then we'll have another conversation and maybe they'll have additional doc or additional accommodations or different accommodations. Um, so we definitely let students know that like, this is not the only meeting they can have with us to determine appropriate accommodations. We also provide e-text, uh, and then the textbook can be an audio, large print, braille. We provide ADA furniture for the classroom, uh, assistive technology. So we use Kurzweil, which is a reader software, Glean, which is uh, helps with note taking, and an, an Echo Smart Pens also help with uh, note taking. And it's definitely different ground now, where like five, six years ago, everybody was just getting all the apps, and it was provided to them where students kind of now have their own apps that they're becoming more familiar with and they kind of keep. So we'll like say, hey, do you want to use this app? And they're like, I'm really, I already used this in high school. I kind of want to keep on using this one. So that's fine with us. Um, and then the logistics of accommodations. So for example, setting up CAR, ASL interpreting, getting uh, access to classes to ensure accessibility. Um, and this is an, uh, all in collaboration with the student, faculty, and the DRC. So it's it's really everybody has to come to the table for this to work. Um, and then have collaborative meetings with faculty and students to make sure that accommodations are being met. So if a student has a question or like, are there, uh, they're concerned that their, their accommodations might not be, meet, be met, uh, we'll have a meeting and kind of help with some anxiety that might be happening. All right, so the next kind of sections are, we have a uh, handout that uh, is a little bit old, but still relevant. Um, and it talks about the laws, uh, documentation. And so we're gonna go through just like small parts of how high school to the and the bridge to college is different. So in high school, Students are covered under uh, IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and that's providing success. So accommodations to support, to show that the student can be successful in that, that's the, the goal. The ADA is about access. So it's kind of like the high schools can provide modifications, where in college you can provide access. The documentation process. So in high schools, the school creates and provides documentation of the disability via I, the IEP uh, or the 504 plans. And then in college, the student is responsible for providing documentation of the disability. Documentation guidelines vary by condition and recent evaluations may be required. It is important to check the guidelines of the disability, your disability center. So for our disability center, we still, we accept five, uh, 504s and IEPs. Some colleges don't. So that's a huge uh, difference that, some, that students need to understand. And that in that case too, there are some places that require you to still go by the medical model. So having all of your medical documentation, 
which if you don't have health care or you haven't had an evaluation for several years, it could cost around $3,000. So it is important as we're helping our students make this transition that we're prepping them for this ahead of time and looking into what the requirements are for the institution they want to move on to. Because um, what I don't, what I've heard from our students and what I don't want to continue happening is students get dis discouraged or instead of taking two years at a community college, they're taking, you know, four or five years or they're taking eight years at a university just because of all of these stops and starts that go along with getting proper documentation. And if I could add, if, if the student has a specific learning disability, if that's a category, please write for CCC in what? So is it in reading, writing, or math? Um, because they say specific learning disability and they don't, they never give a diet, like they don't say the category. So we don't know. We can't guess either. Um, same with other health impairment. What, di what medical diagnosis did they have to, to qualify for that? Because um, that's, that's documentation we can accept. And so, and in terms of timeline, I always tell people after spring break, you can start talking to us. You can send your student their documentation and they could forward it to me. Um, you could send it to us, but CC the student. If you don't CC the student, we cannot contact the student. Self-advocacy. Okay, so the student is identified by the school and is supported by parents, teachers, and case managers. Uh, the student must self-identify, and then in college, the student must self-identify to the Disability Resource Center by requesting accommodations and submitting documentation. And then in high school, the primary responsibility for arranging accommodations belongs to the school, and then in college, the primary responsibility for self-advocating belongs to the student and the responsibility for arranging accommodations is shared between the student and the DRC. So the big thing is like, we can't say because you have a disability, you have to meet with us. We can say, hey, if you do have a disability and it does impact your ability to learn or take a test and you want to seek accommodations, you should come talk to us. Uh, and then for in high school, teachers approach you if they believe that you need help. And then in college, that might happen, but students must uh, initiate contact with instructors and school staff for assistance. That's most likely it's going to happen. Um, but I, I, all the students, uh, I think that's a good path is to start learning about self-advocacy. Um, and we do that with like the letters, you know, we tell students like, Hey, you can ask like, Hey, did you receive my accommodation letter? And then that kind of can start with the talking point. Um, so it's something that we often work with students about. So parental involvement, parents can, uh, can engage with the school staff about the student without student consent or, uh, pre uh, precedence, uh, and then in college, the parents cannot engage with school staff without a FERPA, uh, released or signed by the student. And even if the student is under age, so we do have a FERPA law, it's, uh, privacy. And so, um, the DRC will say general, uh, information like, Hey, did my student request their accommodations? We'll say like all students need to request their accommodations every term. So, uh, we can't give your students details, but we can give general information. But if you do want a FERPA sign, we do, uh, we can provide that. All right, instruction. So for in high school, teachers can modify curriculum and or alter pace of assignments. And then in college, uh, instructors cannot modify the qual uh, quantity of the assignments or alter assignments, assigned uh, assignment des deadlines. Uh, and then, you know, ex exceptions can happen. So for example, um, if a student's seeking medical treatment or they have a diagnosis that it's, uh, you know, unsafe, and it's just, they're unable to complete the assignments. Um, there is exceptions to that. We have, it's called flexible attendance and flexible homework uh, accommodation. And then if the student completes 70% of the class, 
they can ask the instructor for a uh, incomplete and then that will give the student extra time to uh, complete the assignments to get a grade for that class. And just a note in the chat, Deb is saying to make contact early in the year. I've seen students go to their instructor at the end of the year and say they should have been receiving support. It isn't effective in hindsight. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so we do say we can't be retroactive. So we do let students know um, that, you know, once you have your accommodations, you can move forward, but we can't move back. So if they failed their midterm, uh, we can't, you can't retake it. We can't say, oh, the accommodations should have been there. Um, we do have, you know, and please don't, sh I mean, you, everybody can show up at any time, but the more you plan, the more time you'll have. And if there's a mistake or you need to catch up on something, then that gives you more room. Um, but fall term, we were three weeks out. We were having students like I would say to students like, hey, if my three o'clock show up at three o'clock and if my three o'clock shows up, then I can I if they don't show up, I can see you. But if they do, then I can't see you um, because it was about a three week wait. So it's we're busy. We're a busy uh, department. Uh, so for tutoring and studying support, maybe uh, maybe a service provided by the IEP 504 plan or the, in the support room. And then tutoring does not fall under the disability resource or the disability services, but is available free to all CCC students. So they're, it's not connected with us. How are we doing on time? We are fantastic. We're, we're great, yeah. man. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Fantastic. okay, so uh, assistive technology. I mean, I'm talking to the pros here. Uh, so the Echo Smart Pen. I mean, this is... It's dated, but like sometimes you really just don't need to fix the wheel. Some people still will, they'll still need the writing. Um, I encourage this for like students that are in like the medical program. So then they can print um, on the paper. So then take notes with uh, the slides on them. So I, I, I like Echo Smart Pens. Lean is a really nice note-taking software where you can record and then it kind of timestamps and then you can upload the PowerPoint and just kind of have a more interactive note-taking support. Question, Felicia, if you go yeah. back to the Echo Smart Pen. Yeah. Can you have examples of when that works best for a student? Yeah, so... Um, so if a student is not a strong writer, so for example, instead of writing, if them getting, uh, having trouble, you know, oh, did I write this one word right? They're just going to be able to record it and then write quick notes so then they can come back. Other ways that it's at, it has been used is um, they print their PowerPoints on it. And so then they can press record. And then when the instructor writes uh, on the board, they can write on the PowerPoint on their paper. So like it can sync what happened in class and on the PowerPoint. Um, what other good, I, 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 students use them for flashcards. I think that that's a really good way to use them. So if you're providing the accommodation at your institution level, is this something that the, the cost of this technology would be covered by the institution and not be on the student, correct? We have, I would say 50 smart pens. We run out of 50 smart pens every term. So get them while, if you, if you wanna use them, get them. We also have, uh, so the students ca can't use both technologies. So we have the Echo Smart Pen for taking notes and then we have Glean. So the students have to choose one or the other. Um, some students like the pen, some students like the uh, Glean. Um, it just varies. And like sometimes students have uh, better penmanship and they want to take notes, but still record. Um, some students would, they're like, they're honest. And they're like, I'd be distracted to be on my phone, Felicia. I need a pen. 
So, um, and that's great. I mean, when I, when I hear that from students, I'm like, that's great. Cause that means, you know, yourself enough that you're, you want to use a pen and, and that's what would keep you focused. Thank you for that. And Michael Pantino said the Notability app also yep. has a similar recording and playback function. Yeah. So Notability is kind of the student, a lot of high school students are using it. And then from high school, they'll just say like, oh no, I have my Notability. That's, and that's what another thing that we try to cross, uh, the bridge that we try to cross at CCC is we're preparing students to uh, transfer to a university or a college. Um or the workforce. So what we do is like these accommodations that you're receiving here, you should, if you want to seek accommodations here, you should, you know, seek accommodations in the workforce is also something and using notability in, you know, in your education and using notability in the workforce are two similar things. And then to go back to curves, well, oh no, I haven't gone to curves yet. Okay. And then Glean is a great resource. Um, it's nice for the students. You know, it's unfortunate we don't teach note taking. We're just supposed to learn it. And I think that this, um, the way things are sectioned off in this program, I think it really helps students kind of like categorize and um, have a more interactive note taking experience. So for Kurzweil, Kurzweil is free for all CCC students. Um, they just need to contact us and let us know that they would want a, an account and we'll make them one. Um, my example of this is I used to use this all through my education. Um, and I've been using this since 05. And, uh, but I recently used it five years ago because I needed an Oregon driver's license. And I was in Wyoming and they're like, you have to take the knowledge test. And I was scared. So I uploaded it, it my the driver's manual to Kurzweil uh, because I didn't know what happened if you didn't, if you failed this test. Uh, um, so that's where I, I think students kind of perk up uh, when they're like, oh, I could read the driver's manual. And I think that this is a good way, you know, because if they have a positive experience and they complete a quick goal, by using this program, they're going to use the program again. So, um, so yeah, that's this one easy way that you can use Kurzweil. It has all the bells and whistles. You can change the voice. You can highlight. You can, I don't know, edit, edit now. Like it's it's a good program. Um, but there's other programs in out there now. It's just Kurzweil is what we use. Um, to upload a lot of our e-text and so students can listen to them. But again, students have their own apps like Voice Dream Reader that they'll use um, to save all their books. And there's just some more discussion in the chat about um, Grammarly for um, coworkers that have dyslexia and loving it. And uh, a lot of the time students are not learning how to take notes. so. Um, they were trialing the echo pen, but they weren't really successful with it. And that's another thing that we can make a bridge to. Um, I know that students in high school right now are you getting some more organization supports as part of their IEP and note taking supports. So if you do have a student that's about to make another leap, maybe it's to high school or maybe it is to post-secondary, um, what organization techniques do they need? so that they can start learning what works for them. So when they go to a DRC, they say, this is what I need, this is what works for me, or I'm not very strong in note-taking. Do you have any ideas of what could help me? Because they don't have to have all the answers, they just need to know maybe where they need more help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to a parent and they were asking about note-taking or just supports. And I was like, you know, we all can go into a shoe store and want and need different things. And I think that that's kind of like note taking where like you need to, you know, most people need to take notes, but what part of taking notes is really pivotal for you retaining the information and using the notes? You know, I think that if students are not going to use them when the test comes, don't write them. Uh, because what is it helping them now to try to take notes if they're not going to 
use them in the end, you know? So take notes that are relevant to them. Um, cause I, I, I use that example with, uh, a calendar. A lot of students will get a physical calendar, write all their assignments. And then that calendar ends up at the back of their truck. You know, is that a good organizational, uh, tool for them, you know, and I, I get, tell them like, let's do a sticky note. You are going to carry around the sticky note and it's going to be your to do. And then tomorrow you get a new sticky note. And then if you didn't do something, you got to write on your new sticky note stuff you didn't do yesterday. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, sometimes it's really simple things. And, uh, but sometimes it's like every day I'm going to check my phone. Like, yeah. Sounds great. Uh, so to refer students, you know, we, we, this is a part of a CCC presentation where we say, put it in your syllabus. Um, but you could also put, you know, accessing a DRC website as like a goal, you know, research, what do the, you know, how does it, the first steps work at Chemeketa? How does the first step work at PCC or, uh, Oregon State, stuff like that. Um, send documentation to the student and then student can send the documentation to the DRC. I think that's huge because that means the student has a documentation if they switch colleges. Um, and then student will want to re want the referral and seek accommodation. So if they don't want the referral or seek accommodations, we can't move forward. And then here's just a copy off of our website. Um, refer the students to the DRC, send documentation, meet with us, and then you're going to request your accommodations. We did it, Rebecca. You did it. Rebecca <laughs> thought we were going to be like pushing time. And I was like, I don't know. I don't... Yeah. So does anybody have any questions or want to have more conversations about One of the things you kind of referred to that um, that I'd love to hear a little bit more about is, um, like you mentioned, your your college provides Kurzweil. What if a kid, a, a student, comes to you and says, well, I only know how to use read and write, mm -hmm. and that's what I've been using in school. What's the, what's the process there? What do they need to know about that? I mean, so we let them know like, Hey, here's our, you know, how they're similar. Um, cause I think that that's the scary part is like learning new software. Um, and then we'll ask them like, what are, what do you look for? Or what do you need from like, what do you use in read and write? Um, cause then we get into the kind of like brands and cause, uh, I mean, that's, I think that's a statistic is like people with disabilities are very brand loyal. Um, and so we kind of say like, well, what do you use? Like, what are the features you use? What do you like about it? And then, you know, this is what we can offer. And then we offer like the free app. Cause that's the thing is like, I want these students to use this at home. I want them to refer their friends to it, you know? Um, because there's other apps out there. And like, once we cross that bridge of like, oh, what do I really need? What features do I need? Um, Cause I love read and write, read and write's great, but like we can't afford read and write. So if somebody, if that was really working for them at high school, I mean, it, it probably should be part of their accommodation or their transition plan to think of how to get that tool um, if it's not the tool that is being provided at the college that they're going to. And I, I, I hear you say that, OK, the features and similar, but we do know that there are people who this is my right arm. You can't take that away. And so what do you do? I think it helps us in planning and transition to help them find a way to get it if that's the tool mm -hmm. um, that works for them. Just a thought. Mm 